All right, let's go on to the doctrine of angels. And Okay, our pivot verse here is Psalm 148, verses 2 through 5. 2 and 5, I'm sorry, 2 and 5. Okay, the question that you're going to want to answer is, when were the angels created and what does the Bible call them? First of all, when were the angels created? Anyone on that one? When were, when were they created? Dan? Uh, before time. Before time. Before the earth was created. Okay. Um, anything else you want to say, Dan? When did time start? <laughs> On your mark, get set, time. Oh boy. <laughs> That's cute. That's right, it does. Yeah. She's a literalist. She literally says it's in the beginning. Yes. 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 I mean, we have the measurement of the first day. And this is something to consider. Um, but then, you know, there is a pre... Actually, the question would be, when did history start? History. Which history? Well, if it's man's history, then it began at, in the beginning. Creation. But angels were created prior to that, and we don't know how much time, okay, that they existed before then God gets down and forms man out of the dust of the earth and then breathes into his nostrils the breath of lives. The interesting thing, though, is that <clears throat> that was a definite epoch of existence. And what are angels classified as or called angelic host. What could we say about angelic hosts? What, what kind of uh, parameters? Well, I think, yes, exactly. They were, they were created as a finite number, specific number was created. Um, <clears throat> anything else we could say? It's, yes, they are not subject to death. Okay. As we understand, and we're going to go into the three types of death that impact human beings, but angels are not subject to death. They can be... Um, exercised and then ultimately the lake of fire. What else should we know about angels? They do not possess a what? Body. A body. They are immaterial without bodies. Often they desire to seek a physical body for which they have then another means of interacting or interfacing with the physical world. 
but they are immaterial. Actually, that, that uh, brings us to the list of three characteristics of angels that are different than men. Not subject to death, without material bodies, and thirdly, superior power. But the, the emphasis is on the word power, which is different from authority. And this will be very critical, as we said, in terms of understanding the angelic contest, the angelic conflict. Yes? I have a random question. So angels seek material bodies, like a dead body or just like God creates a body? by means of possession, by reason of the fact that the, every person is born um, physically alive, but what? Spiritually dead, yes. The soul assuming a, a uh, boy, I had a word for somebody shared this word on that, but the soul Oh, I know what we said. We said that at the fall, man fell up. His soul took on a position outside of its design. And so now, the believer who is now inhabited and filled with the Holy Spirit cannot be possessed bodily. Jesus Christ, now, you know, we, we read of that in the New Testament and how he dealt with unclean spirits and, and demonic possession. Uh, interestingly, you know, people with you know, physical ailments related to demonic possession. And I think that we, we've gotten a little too scientific here in the West. You know, we don't even call sin, sin anymore. So there could be you know, various maladies that could be directly attributed to demonic possession demonic operation. And it doesn't have to take on the dramatic, you know, like uh, some kind of program where somebody's head is turning around 360 degrees or, you know, <laughs> uh, you know that kind of dramatic. It, it could be much more sublime, much more subtle, um, very, very uh, intellectual, inhabiting a, a professorship at a university or a director's chair at a hospital, you know? And it's not that we're looking, you know, like under for everything, you know, is that demonic or, no. But it does require that we understand that, that this world system hasn't changed. Okay, we have been changed by the new birth, but the world system hasn't changed. And so, though we tend to think that we see a lot more demonic activity happening during Jesus' day, the interesting thing was that there, there was minor solutions that were available until he came. And <clears throat> there was all kinds of things that they would do. You know, the seven sons of Sceva had a little business, you know, exorcism, pay as you go, I guess, or whatever. Um, but... Uh, and for Jesus, it was, it was simply speaking. It was not an arm wrestle. It was just simply speaking and, and you're gone. Thank you. Goodbye. Out. Now. So, why? Authority. Authority. And the one thing is, is that sure, as far as demons are concerned, because they're angelic beings, Immaterial, okay, invisible, more powerful, but having not our authority that we have in Christ. We're going to pick it up um, in our next, uh, next thing. What is the one thing the believer has over the angelic host? Ephesians 1.21, Colossians 2.10. You're going to need to give me those examples. And the reason is, is because <clears throat> it, is, it is vital, 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 important that you and I don't square off on a power trip dealing with demonic activity, supernatural phenomena, any of that. 
all of that is like, that's a hands down defeat for our experience because we, that's not our match. We don't have that kind of power. We do have, though, godly authority, spiritual authority on the basis of another, Jesus Christ. See, so that's good that we know that. Then we want to see what verse prohibits the worship of angels. And this is very interesting because um, the Apostle John, as he was in heaven and seeing these things, was being escorted about and talked to by an angel. But he didn't, how can we say it? He was, he was obviously in awe of this creature. And in Revelation 19, In verse 9, he says, And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Verse 10, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said, ah, ah, ah. See that you do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of the brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. Worship God. And you know, it's part and parcel that that's, that's one distinct difference between, I would say, the category of elect angels versus the category of fallen angels. Fallen angels will probably want you to worship them. But the elect angels will say, no. Worship God. Worship God. Okay. Now, on the doctrine of Lucifer, and so Isaiah 14, verse 12, is our pivot verse dealing with Lucifer's preoccupation with himself. Then I'm going to ask the question, what does Ezekiel 28.17 tell us about Lucifer's fall? But you know what? I think, as I was reading that, I don't want to, well, maybe I don't, but um, if we look at Ezekiel 28, we really could go back and look at verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Remember we said that <clears throat> the king of Tyrus was, actually had a historical name. And he had rulership over a specific part of Israel with great influence. And we saw that with that came the introduction of the worship of Baal. Baal, if you take out the hyphen, but the worshiping of Baal was very, very destructive to the fabric of Israel and the Jewish people and was a constant, constant problem. Um, Elijah obviously dealt with them. I mean, they, they actually set up shop right into, you know, into the temple. And 
So there was a, a continuous problem, but this was because there was great um, spiritual power behind um, that particular religion or that particular form of worship. And so we see here that it's not the man. The man is there, but behind him, okay, is this one who is the sealest up of the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. And then we get the inside scoop. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. This is obviously not describing a man. And the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in the day thou was created. Then we hear of his position. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. That was upon the holy mountain of God, as walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 15 is also key. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. I guess Yes, I guess that question, I know I'm going to change it. Because <laughs> I really wanted to ask, what was the source of iniquity in Satan? What was the source? Lucifer, actually, before that time. Where did that iniquity have its source? Hmm? Well, yes, but where did, you know, when it was found, what was the cause? Yes, okay. Yes, and, and but what, what did he become occupied with? Himself. Himself. Oh, man, yes. And he took what he had been given. There wasn't anything wrong with his beauty, because God created that. There wasn't anything sinful about any of that. But that he took that as the basis of not serving the other angels or, and serving God, but serving himself. And if you think of that principle, that has infiltrated the human race in as much as that you know, when a person tells me, says, you know what, I, you know, this is my body, this is my life, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I want to do with me, that's the same spirit. Same spirit. And even if they go and they're successful and accomplished and, and all of that, it's just that they live their life out separate and apart from glorifying and giving Jesus Christ any acknowledged credit. Even... You know, uh, and they don't have to be negative towards God. They're just occupied with themselves. It's very much so. So I think that's how that question is really going to roll. Um, the source of iniquity um, in Satan. Then, in what way does Satan disguise himself today? This is it. I liked, I liked this question. In what way does Satan disguise himself today? David? Angel of light. Angel of light. Now, okay, give me, a, but let's make it practical. I kind of think if I saw somebody walking down 95 and he was glowing. <laughs> I'd say, like, what is that, you know? How, how do you think he might be disguising himself? Yeah, but... Okay, now we're warming up. Real, you know what number one is? Religion. And, but religion as a system of works in terms of getting the approval of God. Um, that's one way in which he disguises himself. You want to know another way? I mean, I think you do. 
Well, wealth, money. Um, okay, I think, um, hmm. yeah, hold that thought because I want to come back to it. It's good. Um, what, 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 is the, what is the caricature of the devil? In other words, how is, he, how is, he, how is his image projected? That, well, that's true. That's what, what's that? Absolutely. The caricature of the devil is like a guy in a red jumpsuit, horns and a tail and a pitchfork, and some kind of troubled look on his face. I think the troubled look is appropriate. But, and, and like as if, so that's his identity? Uh, uh, uh. See, that, that draws people away from his disguise. You know, like that he's probably operative in, in much of the sophistication that goes down in, in the realm of politics. Because keep in mind, the Antichrist must step out on a platform where there's not only military unity, but economic unity. In other words, everybody's going to have to agree on this currency, so that's the currency that's going to happen. Okay, bang, there we go. And also, religious unity. So you've got economics, political, and religion all now at his feet, and he's able to have jurisdiction over all three of those things. That's very powerful. But, you know, just like we see what's happening, you know, with the euro and different things, whatever, you know, we, we back in, I don't know when that was, maybe the late 80s, you know, and uh, we see these nations coming together, currencies, you know. Great Britain held out and said, like, we're not going to do that. But um, we kind of got excited. We said, it's like, wow, you know, like the euro is this consolidation of all these currencies. And, but if that collapses, it only would collapse to bring in, because it's got to be what, 12? It's got to be 12 altogether. So, you know, and it's very interesting. I kind of think that, you know, it, when we look at prophecy or we look at end times, there's much more of the dynamics that kind of take place. One of the dynamics that is in place that God reckons on is the remnant. The remnant. And the remnant means the, the, the absolute number of believers anywhere, everywhere, that make up the body of Jesus Christ. It's what Abraham was praying for concerning <coughs> Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, he was praying for his family, but he put to God, he would say, listen, God, would you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? And God says, no. Well, then if there's 10, even 10 remnant, would you not destroy? So, we see a principle here because then God is willing to withhold judgment for a rather small number. But, however, that's a true number. That's, a, that's an existing number. And it's not a denomination. It's not a movement. It is, it is absolute. And, you know, there are, the, some here make up that number. Okay? Now, so when there seems to be an apparent fulfillment of a prophecy, okay, it can actually come right up to that point and then, be, and then recede because of, of revival. Revival breaks out and changes the whole equation, see? Um, the, uh, let's see. During the Second World War, there were many prominent theologians who felt that Hitler was the Antichrist. And they had pretty good reason to think that. Okay? Um, and, you know, this, you know, historically, the First World War was supposed to be the war to end all wars. It was just horrific. It was like, Absolutely devastating. They couldn't imagine anything being more catastrophic 
in terms of war as, as the First World War. Okay? But there it was, the Second World War. And then seeing how uh, Germany rose to this military preeminence quickly, very, very quickly. And it involved also the economics um, of the time. So here are these theologians, and they're looking at this, and they're saying, you know, this seems like you know, the, the things are coming together for the platform for the Antichrist. You've got political alignment. You've got, you know, military conquers. I mean, I mean, uh, like, the Panzers just blitzed right through Poland. And you're, I mean, before you blink an eye, the man's, you know, domain has expanded four times. So military conquest. And then you had this. And we don't know much about this, however, there are some volumes that talk about the spiritual dynamics, which involved what he wrote, what Hitler wrote in uh, Mein Kampf about his spiritual connections, which actually was anti-Semitist. He was anti-Semitic um, in his view. And that came out, of course. And by the way, it wasn't just him, but it was a, it was a viewpoint um, that was taken up taught in academic circles, taught in higher levels of education. And they say that, that, uh, that Auschwitz wasn't the result of a military decision. It was a philosophy being taught in the universities of the day. See, In other words, it was an idea, concept, viewpoint that inevitably would trickle down to being able to make that kind of decision about a people group and to, you know, attempt to exterminate them. And this is why we would say that, you know, Satan over here, he, you know, he wants you to get involved with the jumpsuit guy when he's really over here in the universities communicating a premise that will then have an effect later and make for decisions that, in retrospect, you say, like, how could we have made those kinds of decisions? And, you know, when, when, um, when the... Uh, post-war trials, um, and they would bring, bring these, these German officers in, and you know, uh, the Nuremberg trials, and, and they would give testimony of like, what decisions they would make to allow this to happen. You were, you were in a position, you knew that this train carrying you know, 15,000 Jews, and you, you signed off on the fact that you knew that it was going to the gas chambers. Why did you do that? And it's, it's almost incredulous because on one hand they say, I was only doing what I was ordered to do. That was usually the cop-out. Versus I was doing the thing that was to be done. Meaning that they had taken on this, this spirit, this amazing spirit of the age. And uh, by the way, the Germans have a word for that. And, uh, and it's good, zeitgeist, meaning the, the, the spirit of the times. And in every kind of you know, period of time, that, that zeitgeist kind of comes together. Certain things politically or economically or, or, or otherwise. And, uh, and we can see great movement in people's, a great shift in the way people think, okay? I think, that, I think of the time in which, you know, um, early 50s, okay? And the, the idea, and this is, this is where Ian, these guys jump off at, the higher critics, okay? All of a sudden, the Bible was open game to be criticized, uh, not, not religiously, but intellectually, and, uh, and criticized on terms of its veracity and, and so forth. You know, you, you could go back in this country, and it's amazing, but even, even people who were unsaved had a deference of respect towards the church, whatever they want to call that whatever they want to call it. If they were to go in, they were unsaved, something come out of a saloon, and, and they were going to go into a church, they would take their hat off. It was just that way, you know? That was the zeitgeist of the time. Well, we don't have that anymore. I mean, you know, it's not, 
you know, people don't view the church, saved or unsaved, as on that, in that manner. And I don't mean just deferring to a building, but a, an attitude, a, a, a respect, uh, you know, just a common sense respect. By the way, it has that to do with young people and, and elderly people, you know. Um, anyway, we're, we won't go there. So... Um, So those disguises, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll put an S on there. What ways? Because, <laughs> I mean, there's the number, and I want you to, you know, just think about it. Think about it. Think about how Satan intends on oper operating un, you know, unidentified, unrecognized, and unhindered, and probably very much accepted. All right. Then we say, what is the difference between strategies and tactics? And um, this is important in as much as that uh, if I do not know what the overall strategy is, then I will not recognize the tactics. And I don't want you to think of strategy as just the big thing and the tactics just the little thing, because we illustrated it by saying that, that um, the D-Day invasion, the Normandy invasion, um, was a massive, massive military maneuver. Massive. You're talking about getting a million human beings on a 27-mile strip of land, beach, in less than 24 hours. Plus have them encamp somewhere for seven months before the actual invasion takes place and kind of do that without being seen. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just a cool story, but I mean, that's how it was. But this massive kind of military uh, maneuver, well, it was still a tactic because the overall strategy of why you know, the Second World War was fought was what? You don't have any military buffs in this room, man. The overall strategy, I'm glad you woke up in that pain. You know, see. <laughs> the overall strategy, yes. Okay, that's a tactic, but I mean, what? No, now you see, I, you guys are thinking tactically. The overall strategy, what was the overall goal? Second rule. Defeat what? Third Reich. Okay, I mean, I think, is that what you were going to say? Of course. In other words, <laughs> yeah, like why are we doing this? What is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal wasn't to get a million men on a beach, 27 mile stretch of beach in 24 hours. That was a tactic. But we had to get that there in order to then move east and then go to Berlin and capture the Germans and, and bring in, you know, peace they would say, okay, the end of the war. Okay. So, uh, hmm. so just so that we understand the difference between strategies and tactics. Any questions about that? Yes. Mm-hmm. And the tactics are, are smaller, uh, m what we would say, maneuvers to accomplish the goal. But I got to know what the goal is. Otherwise, I'll, I could be busy about doing something that doesn't accomplish the goal. All right? 
Um, oh, I know. Great. Great. This is good. Um, evangelism. Is that a strategy or a tactic? Why? Wait a minute. Somebody said it's a goal. It's a, it's a tactic. Good, thank you. I'm glad you asked. Because for someone to get saved is beautiful. But Jesus said the Great Commission is to go and make what? So yeah, they got to get saved. I can't make a disciple unless they get saved. But after they get saved, they, they may not become a disciple. The goal is for us to be conformed to the image of Christ. So now I need the tactic of evangelism. I also need the tactic of Bible school. I need the tactic of church involved. See, the, this is how you want to see it. And many times a ministry could be deficient because it's occupied with a tactic. Like, for instance, if someone says that it's very important that you are filled with the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? Well, then we're going to make sure that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, we're going to make sure that you're speaking in a tongue, and then, and then you're all set. Well, no, that's a tactic. See? Because that's only one part of a larger picture. And what is the objective, the goal? Paul had to deal with the fact that, that though the Corinthian church was lacking no gift, they weren't fulfilling the Great Commission. They were fulfilling the Great Confusion. And the problems that arose because they didn't see the big picture. And because they didn't, they didn't know how any of these other elements fit in their proper relationship. So that's all I'll say on that. And that's, that's a fair illustration there. OK. Um, doctrine of man. And we're going to finish up here. What does it mean that man is born physically alive but spiritually dead? I think you should know that. I think you do know that. Um, do we believe in dichotomy or trichotomy? Try. Okay. Um, then you're going to list the five parts of the human soul. Mind, emotions, volition, conscience, and self-conscience. Okay, here's another question. What are the three deaths that man is subject to and what impact on one's relationship to God? What's the first death? Spiritual death. Spiritual death. Second death is what? Physical. So the first we could say is under spiritual death is the separation of the creature from his creator. Spiritual death is a separation of the creature from its creator. Because we don't want to just think of death as entering into a state of non-existence. This is why we said it in the other question that you know man was born physically alive but spiritually dead. I mean, he, he continues to exist physically though he is spiritually dead. So death doesn't mean annihilation or entering into non-existence. Separation is, is a good word for it. Um, then the third death is eternal lake of fire. And that is, that is the creature being forever separated from the creator. OK, very good. Then on the doctrine of sin, iniquity, and evil, 
What is the Hebrew word for sin and what is its definition? Hata, meaning to do wrong, miss the mark. Miss the mark. And it'll take a little time, I think, in order for, for us to see this word in the context of its definition, not as a commentary on a person, meaning this. I can miss the mark and fall short, but the key thing here is, is the measurement that I didn't hit the target and I didn't come to the full completion of something. Versus when someone says, well, so-and-so has committed a sin. Well, what do you mean? Well, they were chewing gum in the back of the classroom. Okay, all right, that's how you view that. See, that's, that's more of a, of a commentary on someone's behavior, all right? But, you know, that may not have been missing anyone's mark because it maybe never was set up as a mark. But hata means to do wrong, to miss the mark. And then we have, finally, the list of the three divine imputations to man. And I'm going to ask you to know it all. Because this is so key to positional truth, which we'll take up next year. This will be so key to church life, which we'll take up next semester. And that is that, number one, Adam's sin was imputed to every human. Romans 5, 12 through 14. Second one, every human sin imputed to Christ. I think many times people understand this, the second imputation. They often do not understand the first imputation. And the first imputation has much to do, as we said, with positional truth. And the fact of, well, it's called original sin, meaning the sin of Adam, of what he did, has been imputed to me, though I didn't do it. I mean, I have personal sins that I do, but the sin that Adam did was imputed to my account so that God could take, like he's imputing by one man, the first Adam, he will now impute a second time by a second man called Jesus Christ. And that's the third one that's listed here, that the absolute righteousness of Christ is imputed to believers. So... Uh, principle, if God is willing to impute original sin to, a, uh, to, humanities, to humanity, he is then enabled to impute righteousness to humanity, to those who believe. And he's just on both causes. That's the key. He's just to do the first, so he's able to just to do the second. Divine imputation. All right. Any questions? Anything that uh, you'd like for me to go over again, or repeat, or highlight? Yes. Garden. But it wasn't iniquity or evil, was it? No, actually, that's a very good point. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what, what did Eve do? Like the last of uh, wood, whatever this fruit promises. Well, the Bible says that the woman was what? Deceived, that's right. Now, here's, here's something that's, that's important, and you're bringing up a good point. Adam wasn't. 
Adam was clearly cognizant of what he was doing. He made a volitional choice, which, by the way, covers every aspect of sin. You know, there's the sins of ignorance that I don't even, you know, like, I, I didn't know that, you know, like, okay, but Eve did that too. And then there's the sins of cognizance. I know exactly what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, both put me in the, in the same box. But for Eve, it was literally a a disbelief of what she had been told by God. And I want you to think of this for a minute because she was told, if I eat of that tree, I will surely die. Who told her that? God did. Okay. And now she's hearing something else. You won't die. Now, of course, it was deceitful. It was a lie. But she had to (laughs) disengage herself from what she did know in order to accept a lie. Now, I want us to think about this as well. Because how are you tempted? How is anyone tempted? I mean a real temptation. If I were to, uh, okay, this is is my phone, and I leave it there, and I get my stuff, and I go out the room. Now, you have one of two thoughts to think. Either you're going to say, oh, my gosh, he's leaving his phone, and I go out, and you you come and get me, and I get my, or you bring it to me. Or you're thinking, I was praying about a phone. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, (laughs) of the air. (laughs) Where did all that happen? That's right. That's right. And the the suggestion can come. Now, by the way, now, if, if that thought came, Is it your thought? More than likely not. No, no, no. But it came. What are you going to do with that? Bye-bye. And the the deal is not to pond. Here's, here's Here's a little snare that happens. Like, why did I, oh my gosh, why did I think that thought? I am, I, yes, that's right. You are a wicked, wicked sinner. You shouldn't even be sitting in this class, not one more minute. You should drop out of Bible school. Yeah, I mean, see, this analysis, see, and you know, when so Eve was suggested that she could eat of the tree, she then began to analyze, hey, you know, that looks pretty good. That's not bad. So, you know, it's all in here. Lust of the eye, you know, the lust of the flesh, and the what? Pride of life is almost saying, I know what I'm doing. Or, or somebody could say, well, you know what, I, I can handle that. You can handle what? I, I, I can handle that thought. Not going to happen. So, and this is why, uh, you know, the, we, in our armor, by the way, um, the listing of the armor of God con- is concluded by what piece? Is that right? Word of God? There's one more piece. It's one more piece. Close. Prayer. 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 It's there. You go read it. It's there. And it's amazing that, you know, we can think of the helmet of salvation. Yes, of course, breastplate of righteousness. Yeah, I was say it's a girt. You know, truth. Yes, shod feet. Yes, every sword. Yes, come shield. Yes. Prayer. 
is awesome. It is awesome. And we were saying this recently that the Bible says that the king, that the heart of the king is where? Yeah. And God can turn that heart whithersoever he will. But you know what God would do whithersoever he will? Whatsoever we might ask in prayer. And instead of me thinking I got to like deal with people like this, I deal with people like this. <laughs> because, see, God can get where I can't get the issues of the heart. And we get bamboozled and thinking like, you know, like maybe I could convince this person. We, don't, we can't convince anybody. I didn't get convinced that I needed to get saved. It was work of God. God got on my heart. You know, like the person left and, you know, I, I gave them a hard way to go. They thought, man, they just, I don't know, want a soul whenever again. <laughs> but little did they know, you know, a handful of seconds after we parted, man, this thing was like working on me until I got home. And then something had to be done. But the point I'm saying is this. Uh, you know, we, prayer, incredible, incredible part of our spiritual armor much as the word is yes and you know on the offense but prayer is like phew, indispensable indispensable so add that to the forte have that as as part of your armament okay any other questions or comments yes you mentioned word trichotomous is that body mind and soul what, what makes up the, the, the contract economy? Spirits of the body? <clears throat> sure. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Yes. Yeah, this diagram that we have is about the heart, mm -hmm. channel ABC. Mm -hmm. Here. I think you want to turn it over, Sean. Yeah. Where's the B? And how is it related to the conscious, subconscious, and unconscious mind? That what B rates? Yeah, the, the A, C, and B is probably the center. Yeah, it's not on that on the flip side. Oh, yeah, on the flip side. Okay. Yeah, how is it related to the conscious, subconscious, and unconscious mind? Well, the unconscious mind makes up 90% of your, your mind. 10% is the conscious aspect of it, okay? And much of what happens in our lives is often relegated to the unconscious part of the mind. And the thing that addresses that is the blood of Jesus Christ, meaning this that often people have, have unconscious sources of conscious problems. In other words, there's unconscious sources that they have suppressed, they have ignored, they have denied. It was like what Pastor Vieter was talking about, you know, men living in denial, you know. Well, it's more like suppression. That, that goes, but it doesn't go away unless it's dealt with. And so the... Um, for channel B to function means that there is, uh, Proverbs 24, 3 and 4, there is, there is an internal structure formulated by the Word of God now. The Word of God becomes a grid screen, okay? The Word of God becomes that which filters information that's coming from the external, and that's what protects C. See, that's what protects uh, my soul from buying into these projections and buying into. This is why I think God was busy teaching Adam and Eve doctrine. And they had to learn the word of God as well. And so as we do so, we are, we are setting up for a healthy soul and 
a healthy unconscious because, see, then the garbage doesn't go into the unconscious part of the mind even though I'm consciously exposed to it. For instance, I can't run away from everything of the world. There's, you know, I can't go somewhere and not be exposed either musically, visually, audibly, whatever the case may be, 100% of the time. But if I have, of course, categories, that protects my heart from that kind of activity, which we say instead of isolating yourself, you insulate yourself. Because, see, we're commanded to go into the world, see, not run from it. But we need to go in unless, like, you know, we mentioned just briefly about the whole armor of God. And that is awesome for us to operate in this world system, having a soul, having a spirit, and living in this physical body. So. Oh, we're going to go into that next year. That should wet your whistle already. Huh? I said, that should wet your whistle already. That's a, uh, <laughs> that should pique your interest, get you excited. Like you're going to be up all night long reading your Bible. I'm sorry, I can't hear. You're as bad as I am. I'm terrible. I'm very soft-spoken. But go ahead, one more time. A little bit louder. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. For the, the physical death yes. um, and the impact on your relationship with God, yes. isn't, it, isn't the result of that just that you are with God? If you are saved. Yes. Is there anything else you wanted? Well, no. I mean... Did I, is there anything else I want? Well, Snickers bar, but no, not tonight. <laughs> um, no, that the physical, the physical death, um, I'll, I'll put it this way. You, you could cite Lazarus and the rich man. Any, anyone else? Last call. Yes. Session is the is the final arrival of the God Man to the right hand of the Father. That was the position that Lucifer kind of got a glimpse of, and he thought it was for him. But, um, yeah, that's where Jesus Christ now presently is, ever living to make intercession for us. I'm glad you asked. Okay. Well, that's it. Let's pray. Father, thank you. And please help us to remember not to do our vocabulary Thursday afternoon at 4.45. <laughs> and, uh, but that we could just, you know, have fun with it, enjoy it. And also, Lord, thank you that... Uh, along with everything else that will be happening uh, exam week, God, that you just would keep us healthy, Father, just, you know, that we could run, and, but run with patience and, and not be stressed, be very relaxed, be very cognizant, very focused, very thankful. And, uh, and we do. We thank you for this, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for this incredible year, incredible incredible, Lord. It's just amazing. The focus, the attention, the capacity, and Lord, that you, you have your hand upon each one here, God, in a very precious way. 
And I count it a deep, deep privilege to, to just be before them, Lord. So please continue to uh, amplify yourself, magnify your ways, give us insight, illumination, confidence, assurance in you. And so we thank you. Bless us until we meet next Thursday. In Jesus' name, amen.